Shalom. And welcome to Betariel Messianic Congregation and Hak Sameach. Happy Feast of Sukkot to all of you. You know, by now we have entered the second wave of this persistent coronavirus. Uh, Montreal is in the red zone, the highest alert level. And uh, our Prime Minister said that yesterday that we might need to close other activities in the coming days. Uh, in fact, yesterday there were over 1,100 more cases than death. Whatever it would be, and God willing, Beth Ariel will be here to proclaim God's word, whether we will broadcast from here or from the, my office uh, at home. COVID-19 is also affecting more and more people around the world. The total number of people who have this virus is over 34 and a half million, you know, and over 1 million people have died so far. It's growing and affecting people of all walks, not only physically, but also psychologically, economically, and also spiritually. You know, last week in the U.S., another 837,000 Americans filed for unemployment claims. That is a tremendous amount of people for just one week. And yesterday, we've all heard that the U.S. president and his wife were tested positive for COVID-19. Our prayers are with them. And one country that is being hit very hard is Israel. Uh, they, they say that the number has risen to around 1,000 three months ago, 2,000 two months ago, up to through three to 4,000 of late, to as high as seven to 8,000. And on Thursday, some 9,000 people tested positive. I feel, I want to tell you, I feel there's a spiritual dimension to all this, like an assault on our planet to paralyze it, to render it completely powerless, ineffective. The, the, the work of the Lord is being hampered and in many ways immobilized, but it should not be this way, at least as far as the believers are concerned. As I mentioned during the Wednesday study, we, the believers, have such an important role to play in these difficult times, even in our confinement. We, we have phones which allow us, to, allow us to call and encourage people. We have Facebook, we have YouTube and other media where we can spread the good news about the sovereignty of God, for at the end He will prevail, as prophecy tells us. Furthermore, we have a great weapon at our disposal that of prayer, and we have the time now to pray. Yeshua tells every believer that he or she is what? The salt of the earth and the light of, uh, of the earth. You, you are the light of the world, he says. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Salt itself is a preservative and was used for healing and cleansing, and this is what symbolizes the believer, especially in these times. We are to sanctify it. Our, our, our world. The fields are white for harvest, we remember as we learned through the Feast of Yom Teruach. And it is such a great opportunity for each one to show his or her love for God and for humankind, to bless our neighborhood, to cover them with God's protection and presence and remind them that a new world is coming, one of peace and one of harmony. And this is what this great Feast of Sukkot is about to teach us. And so before we look at this great feast of tabernacles, it is, as it is our tradition, let us first and foremost bless our children. So if you have your children with you, put your hands upon them, right? Again, it doesn't matter how old they are. Just bring them close to you and let's pray. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Le'olam Va'ed Blessed is His name whose glorious kingdom is coming and is forever and ever. Heavenly Father, this morning, we lift up our children to Your throne and pray for great blessings for each one of them. We pray that their love for You would grow and increase in Yeshua's name. We pray our, 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 that our children will develop an, an eternal perspective and purpose, not, not only an earthly one. Help them to see life and every challenge through your eyes, eager and unafraid to share with others the good news of Yeshua wherever they go. I pray that they will set their minds on things above, and I pray that they will come to understand the extent of your love, Lord, for it surpasses all the head knowledge they will acquire in school. Beshem Yeshua Mashiach. Amen and amen. 
You know, this past week, I took a few walks around my home and noticed the changing leaves and, and how it was truly beautiful as each tree was changing, uh, like, a, like a changing tapestry of, of colors. And I thought, if, if we can see such beauty in this troubled world, imagine how it will be like in heaven. This is what Sukkot is about. It awakes us up. To, to, to this longing for, for that better world we are all yearning for. Sukkot is the last of the seven feasts of Israel mentioned in the Torah in Leviticus 23. It is the seventh, like the Shabbat of history. The first six feasts are often considered like the six days of work of creation, and Sukkot is then the great rest for men and also for God. Also for God. This feast symbolizes the coming messianic age of, or the millennium that follows right after the great tribulation that is about to come after the rapture. It is the most joyful of the group of seven. This is why I'm wearing my colorful tali today. Furthermore, Sukkot speaks of that wonderful future the Bible prophecies actually promise. A time where man will live in harmony with his neighbor and with nature. It is beautifully described in, by the Bible as an era where the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, right? This is Isaiah 11, which speaks of the messianic age. It will be a time when animals will not eat each other anymore, but they will eat with each other, right? They will eat together. The way the animal kingdom and nature now functions is not how the Lord originally designed it. It is the way it is because of sin. Animals were not created carnivores. And then looking up in hope, we now set our eyes on Sukkot, that time where man will live in harmony with his creator as well. Something the scripture says, which all men deeply desire. According to, to the prophet Habakkuk, the world will be what filled with the knowledge and of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Just imagine, right? Imagine a time when men will actually love each other, when they will all believe in one true God, when wars and diseases will vanish. Are you longing for this time? You know, anthropologists speak of this of a universal belief, a, 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 a conviction deep in the soul of all men of a past lost period of time. When man was in harmony with God and with his creation, a time like we, we find in the book of Genesis in the Garden of Eden before the fall, before the rise of all these diverse religious systems, which are even today trying to find their way back to this harmony. Men seem to have an inner knowledge of this place. According to these researchers, the primary role of religious leaders, of the shaman, the priests, the rabbis, the imams, was to reestablish this communication with the Creator and restore this harmony. And this is in line with the teaching of the Bible, this emptiness and homesickness which the Bible speaks so much about, this void in our hearts, is due to sin, to the fall which happened in the Garden of Eden. And only Yeshua can fill this void. I want to tell you this. They name this longing a nostalgia of paradise which is common to all men and all religion. After all, we all have the same father, Adam, who must have spoken to all his children about this lost Garden of Eden and seems that we are all endowed with that same nostalgia. The word nostalgia, by the way, is from, from the Greek algos, meaning a grief, a pain, and nostos, meaning homecoming. And it's this very dream and longing the Bible recognizes and, and speaks so much of. And it even tells us that it was an inner desire of all men in the Hebrew Scriptures. Did you know that? For instance, we read in the chapter of faith, chapter 11, that they all of them, waited for the city which has foundation, whose builder and maker is God. Moses, Gideon, the prophets, they all knew about heaven, and it was such an anchor of faith in their lives. This is what they were looking for. That was their reward. Take Abraham, for instance. He was promised the whole land of Israel, yet in his lifetime, this land was not gifted to him. 
The only land he owned was the parcel of property he bought for his wife Sarah, a burial plot. But that did not matter because by faith it is written that he desired a better that is a heavenly country as the Bible says. Ultimately, I want to tell you this is what Sukkot brings us to, to consider. And it is not only man that is longing for this time to come. More than man, God is also yearning for this reunion of peace. In the Hebrew scriptures, it is to the remnant of Israel, his people, that the Lord often spoke of his desire to reestablish with them peace and harmony, to be with them despite their constant rebellion. Isaiah 12.1. He says, in that day you will say, he says, Oh Lord, I praise you, though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort, actually, you comfort me. And we also remember, we remember, you know, in the last Passover, how Jesus anticipated this reunion with us. In the Last Supper, actually, he refused to drink the last cup of wine and said, I will not drink of this fruit of wine. And from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That, that's such a statement, you know. This is his way of telling us that his joy will be full only, okay, when the last sheep of this dispensation, dispensation enters the fold of eternity. Then we will all share in the joys of a great supper, that messianic banquet. There he will have his cup of wine with us. This being said, let us now open our scriptures to Leviticus 23. You're going to have most of the passages on the screen. And there we find the seven feasts of the Lord. For this is what they're called, by the way. They're not the seven feasts of Israel. And, and especially the seventh feast, where we can see the longing heart of God for all his children. Jews and Gentiles, right, to be together. Let's read Leviticus 23, verses 33 to 36. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month you shall, this shall be the feast of tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation. And you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly. And you shall do no customary work on it. So the feast begins on the 15th day of the seventh month. And incidentally, according to the Hebrew calendar, today, Saturday, is the 15th day of this month. And so let us rejoice with God and see how was this feast actually celebrated or how he asked us to celebrate it. During Sukkot, Jews from all over the world, at that time when the temple was standing, from all over the world were summoned to Jerusalem. And they were to spend eight days together with the Lord. With the Lord. And during each of these days, they had a great party, a, great, a, a, a big communal meal, a giant potluck. Imagine. During these eight days, there were a great amount of sacrifices, the greatest number from among all the feasts. Some 200 animals were sacrificed during enough to feed everyone for seven days. And there is one exclusive commandment given in this feast that we don't find anywhere else. God commanded the Israelites to rejoice, to be happy, to laugh, to cheer. And the Israelites were to rejoice every day of these eight days of Sukkot. It was the law, by the way, right? And this is why, personally, I always long for the coming of this feast, for it reminds me of this great future that awaits us in our eternal home. And all, notice, by the way, in the commandment, this extra day in verse 36, the eighth day. What, what do we have? What did God added one more day. The reason giving is found in the words holy, the sacred assembly, sacred, which is one word in the Hebrew, atzera, right? This is special word reserved for Sukkot in Leviticus 23. The word literally means, you know what it means? A detention. 
Okay. And it comes from the word atsar, meaning to shut, to hold back, to detain. Like one ancient rabbi explained, he says atsara, like a king who invites his children to feast with him for a certain number of days. When the time comes for them to leave, he says, children, please stay with me for one more day. I hate to see you go. It was an extra day for rejoicing. The eighth, and the number, the number eight, by the way, in Hebrew, Shmoni, okay, from the root uh, Shmaini, right, means to make fat, to cover with fat, to superabound, as if a parent wanted to prepare his children for the long journey ahead, overfeed them. Remember, remember your mother, maybe? Okay, so, so they would be healthy and ready. And these things testify of our heavenly Father's presence and longing to be with his children. If you think you are longing for this time, God even more. And elsewhere, this word, Hatsara, you know, is also found in Deuteronomy 12, 7 in relation to the Feast of Passover. So this word frames Passover, the first feast, and Sukkot, the seventh feast and final feast, as if to tell us that from the beginning, from creation of the nation at Passover to her final deliverance at Sukkot, God returned her, the nation of Israel, in his bosom by protecting her with his love. And he does the same for the believer from the moment you accepted Yeshua as your personal Savior until you reach your eternal abode. And there is Another command given in these feasts, which enhances the memory, the hope, and the anticipation of a great future, of a world of harmony and peace to come. Let us look at the, the last two verses of Sukkot, verses 23, verse, that is chapter 23, verses 42 to 43. God said, you shall dwell in booth for seven days. All who are natives, Israelites, shall dwell in Booth, that your generation may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in Booth when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. And I am, I am the Lord, your God. Here the Israelites were commanded to live in a full week in Booth, in Sukkahs. Why? What do you think? Sukkahs, by the way, are temporary uh, structures, small huts built with branches. While today Jewish people are required only to eat in sukkahs, the Israelites were commanded in those days to live in these huts for a full seven days. And because these huts were so uncomfortable, whoever slept in one of them would long even more for his eternal abode. I think this is the point of the sukkahs. These sukkahs are a symbol of our temporary abode here on earth. But there's something even deeper concerning the sukkah. The reason of the commandment in verse 43. Let us read it one more time, verse 43. It says that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwelt in Booth when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. However, nowhere during the Exodus are we told that the Israelites lived in sukkahs. We're told that they lived in tents which is the Hebrew olel. So why use the word sukkah here, and what are the Israelites to remember when living in these sukkahs for a full seven days? This is where the Feast of Tabernacles comes right to our doorstep today and speaks of God's sovereignty, even though so often we forget, we don't see it. And especially in times of COVID-19. The word sukkah comes from the word suk, which speaks of a pavilion of protection. It means to protect, to cover, to defend. And from, from it comes the word sahak, okay, which means to stop the approach of an enemy, to block, to cover. The sukkah being a cover of protection and a new way to recall the exodus. God did not ask that they made tents, but that they should make sukkahs to, so that we remember his sovereignty and his protection during the 40 year that is wilderness. He wanted the Israelites and ourselves to recall how he protected them for this long period of 40 years. He wants us to reflect on how he nourished 
the Israelites with the manna and provided the water that sprang out of a rock. Do you remember that? He wants us to cast a spotlight on his work and how he protected them from their enemies and made sure that for 40 years, 40 years, their clothes and their shoes did not perish, but were miraculously sustained for all time. They didn't have to buy any, any shoes for 40 years. Imagine. This is what God wants us to remember. This part, I want to tell you, ancient rabbis understood. In the Zohar, they speak of the sukkah as the shelter of faith. As a reminder of love and of the reminder of the security that we have in God. For others, the sukkah symbolizes the divine clouds of wilderness, like a covering of the Shekinah glory or of the Holy Spirit. The sukkah was the Lord when he went before them, as it is written in Exodus, by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. The sukkah then is a reminder of the full protection from God even during the most difficult times the Israelite endures in the wilderness. God was always present with them, and so he is with us today. You know, the sukkah then is a token of his presence during hardship and before the great era of the messianic age to come. You know, while hardship sharpens the believer to preserve and attain great blessings for those who made God their refuge, it's always a sign of, a better, of better times to come. Let me tell you about John Milton, the 17th century poet and believer. He actually, you know, he became totally blind at the age of 43. But he did not give up and produce his greater works afterwards. During his childhood and early years, he loved to study the scriptures. To this, he added mastering the Latin and Greek classics, which he studied in their original languages. And at the age of 47, he immersed in total darkness. He began to begin writing his monumental epic, Paradise Lost, which he com completed in 10 years, and which to these days is generally regarded as one of the most sublime work in the Eng English language. As a writer, they say, he ranks second only to Shakespeare. And what lifted him up of his perpetual darkness was his knowledge of the Bible. He once wrote to a friend that God's word amply, and I'm quoting, I amply furnish my mind and conscience with eyes. He exalted in, in the Lord. His spirit was alive with, with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And instead of being angry, because he had all the reasons in the world to be angry at God and depressed about his condition, he wrote, and I want to quote what he wrote here. He says, while well, God so tenderly provides for me, while he so graciously leads me by the hand and conducts me on the way, I will, since it is his pleasure, rather rejoice than complain at being blind. As someone said, no flower can bloom in paradise which is not, has not been transplanted from Gethsemane. Living in the sukkah is one part of the mosaic law I would love to follow. You know, if we lived in a warmer climate, I would gladly live in, in one of them for seven days to fully appreciate this great message of love and protection. I'm not sure my wife would agree with this, but I would definitely do it. And there's yet, there's yet another beautiful command for this feast that is shrouded with a touch of mystery. Of mystery. This is found in Leviticus 23, verse 40. Look what it says. And you shall take for yourself on the first day, okay, four things, the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. There are four things mentioned, and only two things we can recognize, right? The palm branches and the willows, this we know. Let's start with the palm branches. The palm branches are a symbol of the millennium or the messianic age. We see them as a decor all over the messianic temple described by Ezekiel from chapter 40 to 48. 
Okay, they, they were visible and, and very obvious just at the entrance. They were there in the wall. Okay, and, uh, and they were all inside the temple as well. We'll find them in the inner chamber. And we find them also in the holy place. Ezekiel described this temple with these palm branches everywhere. This is how it became a symbol of the messianic times. And they knew about it. And see this influence in the gospel by red. Remember the triumphal entry? In John 12, for instance, while well, 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 this happened during the Feast of Passover, four days before the crucifixion, there is a connection with the Feast of Tabernacle. There we read, And the next day a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Yeshua was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel, which is a song to, 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 to usher the Messiah. The question is, why did the people use branches of palm trees and then go out to meet Yeshua? Branches of palm trees were things seen during the Feast of Tabernacles, not during the Feast of Passover. Palm branches symbolized the Messianic kingdom. The reason for these branches is because they thought that Jesus was going to establish his kingdom. They recognized him as the Messiah, but they were not taught of his two comings. Here he came to die first and resurrect, but he's coming back. And the next time we read about palm branches in the Bible is in Revelation 7. Before his second coming, John saw so many people ready to enter the messianic age and see what they have in their hands. John 7, 9. And I looked, I was in heaven. And I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, people and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands because they were ready to enter the Messianic age. As for the willows, the willows, this became a symbol of hope for a better time. During the temple time and, and, and during Sukkot, the priests would circle the altar, okay, while carrying actually willow's twigs in their hands and praying, please, Lord, redeem us. Please, Lord, cause us to, to prosper. Both the palm trees and the willows symbolize a time of great abundance. But what about the other two items mentioned in Leviticus 23, 40? The fruit of beautiful trees and the boughs of leafy trees. We're not told actually exactly what they are. And perhaps this is better for it pulls us right to heaven. And there the scriptures tells us that there will be a beautiful tree. Do you know what that tree is? The tree of life. The word beautiful in Hebrew, hadar, means glorious, majestic. As when we read in Psalm 96.6, glory and majesty, hadar, are before you. And perhaps this is why we're not told what, what the fruits of this beautiful tree and leafy trees are, so that we remember our eternal abode, so that we remember actually the words of Yeshua who promises to all believers that actually we're going to eat from this tree. This is in Revelation 2, 7. To all believers, he says, to him who overcomes, because believers overcome. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. No, no, and you know, I'm not sure what it means that we're going to eat of the fruit of the tree of life, except that it will be a wonderful and amazing and marvelous experience which awaits all believers. This through only is enough to sustain us until the coming of Yeshua, no? This then is for the fruit of the tree of life. But it also speaks of Leviticus as the boughs of leafy trees. Okay, why speak of leaves? This brings us to another description of the tree of life in heaven. And listen to this great description in Revelation 22 2, as it describes this city which men and women of God in the scriptures long so much for. It says, In the middle of the streets and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit, fruit every month. The leaves of the trees were for the communion of the nations. Let us just concentrate on the last words. The trees, the leaves that is of the trees were for the communion of the nations. 
This is also what Sukkot is about. A reunion of all the people of God in Jerusalem for eight days. A great communion with God. But in heaven, this communion will be celebrated every month. So great, it would, would be the fellowship, would be together and with the Almighty. And yes, there will be a measure of time in heaven. We will not be lost in eternity, right? There will be, we will live actually in a tangible place, right? The new Jerusalem with its own times of worship. This is how far the Feast of Tabernacle brings us to consider, to meditate on. Jewish tradition gave the middle trees and the boughs of leafy trees and the citron of the fruit of beautiful trees and the, together they form the lulav, the lulav. The four species of vegetation required during this feast. And I love the, 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 the explanation of the lulav. It's, it's a beautiful tradition, especially when you consider that some rabbis have interpreted the lulav as a body, a body. Okay. They, they, they see it forming one body, okay, and this is very appropriate when you consider that the people of God also are a body. They saw Israel as a body. The ecclesia is a body as well. They say that the palm branches represent the spine of the body. The ethrog represents the heart. The willow leaves, actually, uh, they're oval like a mouth, right? And the middle leaves, that is, are shaped like the eyes, like the eyes. So all together symbolizing a whole body together to the Lord. This is how far again the Feast of Tabernacles help, brings us to. But I didn't speak yet of the most important thing about Sukkot. The crux of the message, the best part, this study, is when you consider what Yeshua taught during a feast of Sukkot. He gave such a great teaching and encouragement and an appeal to all to consider this life and the next life to come. And there he also performed one exceptional miracle, a messianic miracle. Did you know that Yeshua did miracles never seen before? That only the Messiah would do. And he did them all. The place of the gospel that we're going to see where he spoke about Sukkot is in John chapter 7 to 9. John 7 2 begins to tell us now the Jews' feast of tabernacle was at hand. That is, Sukkot was at hand. It was a time when he was under very fierce persecution, for they have already decided to deliver him to the Romans to be crucified. The previous verse, verse 1, says, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Judeans were seeking to kill him, but it wasn't his time. In verse 12 of the same chapter, we read that even his own brothers did not believe him anymore. And afterwards, we read that twice. Or three times they tried to seize him. But they could not. Again, because his hour hadn't come. And even though, even through all this, I want to tell you, Yeshua's thoughts were not for himself. It was always for the welfare of the others. Even when he was on the cross. It was for the welfare of the people next to him. Not for himself. The words and teaching of Jesus are often clearer and more enhanced when we consider the historical background of the Feast of Israel. At the time of Sukkot, the Jewish people had developed a tradition. And it's important to know this tradition to understand what Jesus said. They called it the celebration of the water drawing, which the Babylonian Talmud mentioned, you know how many times? 32 times to keep this nostalgia of a better time alive. So important. It was to them. During this ceremony, the priests would walk down to the pool of Siloam, from the temple to the pool of Siloam, as you can see on the screen, and carry water from the pool of Siloam up the hill, right, in golden flask, okay, right up to the temple. If you are in Israel, you know that the hill is very steep, and they did this all the time. And then, by the way, they would take the water and they put it on the side, actually, of uh, the, 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 the altar. Why? Because they wanted to, to, to mimic that, that river that will come out of the, that is, the altar itself and will clean everything. And as the procession came to the water gate, 
actually trumpet blast, shofar blast, were, were made to mark the joy of this occasion. And the people were singing, they were chanting and dancing. The whole of Jerusalem, we're talking about a lot of people. And once at the temple, again, they circled the temple, the, the, the altar that is, with much music. And they reached the temple and the water again was poured on the side. It was such a joyful event that it says in the Talmud that anyone who has not seen the rejoicing of the place of the water drawing in his life has never seen rejoicing. But why would they do that? Where did they get this idea of doing all this, right? Again, the background of this ceremony is found in the chapter 47 of Ezekiel, where he describes the temple messianic times. I just want to read you verse 1. It says, then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. For, for the front of the temple faced east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple south to the altar. And Ezekiel saw a river flowing from the altar. And the water of the river flowed, and it gave life, life to everything it came in contact to. And this is why the Israelites... In the first century, especially, were having these ceremonies because there was a fever for the, for the coming of the Messiah. They knew he was coming because of the prophecies of Daniel. And in so doing, they would set different plants on the altar, by the way. It would be the, the altar of sacrifice, like we, so much greenery. They wanted to mimic the, the Garden of Eden. And at the same time, they would recite, please, Lord, redeem us. And they would repeat uh, these things. And at this time, at this time, once in Sukkot, Yeshua was there among them. And seeing the carrying and pouring of the water to the side of the temple, the altar, that is. We read in John 7, verses 37 to 38, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living waters. The thirst and yearning Yeshua is speaking of here is the one they had deep in their souls. A time of harmony, of peace that they so desired and they expected the Messiah. And see how he interpreted these waters. We read in verse 39. But this he spoke of the spirit of whom, of who believed in him were to receive. Okay, you know that in the Talmud, Okay, I want to quote you what the Talmud, Jerusalem Talmud says. He says, why is it called Shoba, that is water drawing? From, for from there, they draw the Holy Spirit in line with the following verse of scriptures, right? They must have understood what Jesus meant. They interpreted themselves, the water, as being the Spirit. And Jesus says, I will give you that Spirit if you come to me. And Jesus is still saying it today. Come unto me and drink right now. At this very moment, one can drink of this great blessing and receive the Ruach HaKodesh when they accept Yeshua as their personal Savior. And there is something else that he said in relation to the ceremony of the water drawing. In the Mishnah, which is contained in the Talmud and in which the Jewish law at the time of Yeshua and even today are written, we read that during the nights of Sukkot, Four very large lamps in the, in the temple were lit. And a great nightly celebration took place under the light. And people would see the light from kilometers away. Just like the new Jerusalem. Why did they do that? They linked the prophecy of Ezekiel with that of Isaiah. Which speaks of the presence of God which, with, with, with men during this time. It is in Isaiah 60. There he describes the time and says in verse 19, The sun shall no longer be light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give light to you, but the Lord will be to you an everlasting light, and your God, your glory. Because they long for the messianic time, for it was Sukkot. It was Sukkot. No more nights, but the presence of God. And it is then that Yeshua spoke to them. While the lights were burning, he was pleading with them. You know what he told them? I am the light of the world. 
He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. They knew what he was speaking about. He, the Messiah, is the light of the world. Through him comes the spirit of life, and from him comes divine light. Yeshua was then offering salvation and eternal life as he still does it today. He was offering them this time they were yearning for. He is, by the way, the only one who can give us this light. Let's remember this according to the scriptures. And to stamp this powerful message and to further show them that he is the Messiah, the divine Messiah. During this time, he performed that sublime and exceptional miracle that we find in John 9, a long chapter that describes it. It was the miracle healing of a man born blind. At that time, they knew that it was one thing to heal someone who simply got gone blind. But to heal someone born blind required a, a creation, a recreation. And they knew that if somebody would do that, it would be the Messiah. Because, listen to what the healed man said in verse 32. He says, since the world began, it, was, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. And Yeshua did it in such a way, by the way, as to call the attention of everyone there that he is the Messiah. See how he did it, by the way, in verse 6 and 7. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay, and he said to him, Go, wash to the pool of Siloam. So he went and washed and came back seeing. He could, you know, Jesus could have just said a word and this man would have been healed right there on the spot. However, Yeshua made clay and applied it in the eyes of the blind mind. Why do you think he did this? Time was running out and he wanted so much for them to see and realize who he was or who he is. The reason for the clay is because man was made out of the dust of the earth. So the creator of the world here made clay and recreated the eyesight, something they've never seen before. This is an affirmation of his deity. For no one can perform this miracle. It was a miracle of creation. He wanted them to know this. And then Yeshua told this blind man, go, go to the pool of Siloam and wash your eyes. This is at the south part of Jerusalem, the lower arrow, by the way, in the screen. This is where the priests went to take the water and bring it to the altar to reenact the prophecy of Ezekiel and the way leaking the temple to the pool was so crowded. And there were hundreds of people along the path. I can imagine this man just walking down with clean his eyes and just bumping into all these priests. We remember that Sukkot is one of the three feasts where all Jews were summoned in Jerusalem. And so it was very crowded. And the population, according to Josephus, was about 200,000 people. I don't know how they can fit that many people in such a small city. Imagine now again, as the blind man just goes down. And they knew him. They knew him. And it was the first time, as he washed his eyes. It was the first time in Israel that a man born blind was healed because Yeshua had landed in Jerusalem. This is, by the way, the miracle of Sukkot, a miracle when the blind man, a miracle still available to anyone who would like to see God. By the way, we cannot do it by ourselves. We need the, 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 the Holy Spirit to show us this way. And this miracle created a big stir in Jerusalem. The religious authorities could not and did not believe it. The long chapter 9 of John relates many conversations they had with the healed man. And to the point that he could not understand himself why they could not understand his joy. We, we, we see him saying in verse 30, for instance... But he says, why, it's marvelous, he says, a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from. Speaking of Yeshua, yet he opened my eyes. As if he was telling them, you taught me that only God can open my eyes. And when he does it, you kick him out. This is when they excommunicated him. Would you believe that? He was too, a it was too much of a powerful witness. However, the good shepherd 
who always cares for his sheep, found him afterwards and showed himself to him. That would have been the first time, by the way, the healed man saw Jesus, right? Because, you know, he didn't see him at the first. And their reunion, by the way, is moving. As Jesus met him, we read in John 9, 35, then Jesus heard what, that they had cast him out, right? That actually they excommunicated him. And so he goes to him and he speaks to him and he says to him, do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Because he never saw Yeshua. And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him and it is he who is talking to you now. See what the man answered in verse 38. Lord, I believe. And what happened? He worshipped him because he knew who he was. He worshipped him. By this time, he knew who the Messiah of Israel really was. Because you cannot worship but God. This man born blind knew that Yeshua was divine, as the prophecies of the Hebrew Scriptures tell us. And for the first time in this chapter, we read of the great title of the Messiah, the Son of God, verse 35. This is how those who believed in him knew him, right? Solomon, by the way, in Proverbs 30, asks you one question. Do you believe, do you know God, that is? And do you know his son? Let me tell you, his son is Yeshua. Yeshua means salvation. Who can give you that salvation even right now if you accept him in your heart and say, Yeshua, today I accept you as my personal savior. It's the next, the next chapter 10 of John where we find the discourse about the good shepherd, good shepherd that we need, how he gives his life for the sheep. He concluded his discourse with these words repeated twice, John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I'm known by my own. This is an invitation to the gentle waters of Siloam to apply its waters so we can see, as the blind man did and saw and was saved. And when we consider all this, by the way, I mean, it's amazing that the church does not have any celebration for this feast, especially those of them who believe that we are right now in the messianic age, the majority of them today. They should realize that there is a commandment in Zachariah during the millennium that all the nations should be required to observe the feast of Sukkot. And there's even a punishment for those who do not observe it. However, we're not in the millennium yet, but how I wished they would just consider it and see what a blessed message we have in the Lord in this passage when you put the Feast of Israel in the background. I'd like to close by bringing up once again the message of protection we have in God during Sukkot, especially while we are undergoing the second wave of COVID-19, we should know and act upon that knowledge that God is in full control. We may not understand all things, but he's in full control. The last passage I would like to bring to you is found in number 33. If you read it, you will probably wonder why we have this chapter. Why we have so many names of places. Right away, Etham, Baal Zephon. Elim, Dovka, and, and many more through the 56 verses of this long chapter. And if you happen to read it out loud, your neighbor would think that you speak Hebrew already. But there's a very strong message of protection for us in there. In all, by the way, this chapter, there are 42 places named there. These were the places the Israelites traveled during the 40 years journey toward the promised land. But why go over these places at this time? What these places really were, they were desolate camp, campgrounds where the Israelites often faced dangers and perils of starvation, thirst, and enemies. One after the other, the names are mentioned so that one remembers how through all this, God saved them from all their troubles. 42 of them. These 40 years were really a judgment, for it takes only 10 days to, to travel by foot from Egypt to Israel. But even during this judgment, God never forsook them. And in many ways, we are still walking this wilderness until we reach this great city, heaven, that the Lord has prepared for us. And in many ways, we do not need to wait 
until we depart to enjoy the benefit of Sukkot. It is in Psalm 31. Last verse I want to show you. In Psalm 31, the believers today could always find a Sukkah in the Lord. Notice verse 20. The word place is actually the word Sukkah. It says, you shall hide them in the secret place. You shall hide them in the sukkah, in the protection, right, of your presence from the plots of man. You shall keep them secretly in the pavilion from the stripes of tongue. Amen. Let us bow ahead in prayer. Now, Heavenly Father, we, we, we thank you for your presence among us this morning. We thank you for the presence of your Ruach HaKodesh in us, in, in the believers to guide us and to always remind us that we are your children and to always remind us that there's a better world out there waiting for, for us, for those who believe in Yeshua. And we thank you for your word which reveals all these things to us and we know that we can always, always find you among its powerful pages. And we pray today for those present here in the congregation and online as well. Some today need healing, Lord. Some need revival in their hearts. Some need restoration in their friendships. Some need to realize the power of your forgiveness so they will not carry such heavy load of guilt. And for those here this morning who wonder if they've been left behind, who fear you've forgotten them, show them, Lord, through your gentle touch of your Ruach HaKodesh, of your Holy Spirit, that your delays are not denials. May we learn to wait on you and may our strength be renewed and our souls be restored day after day until you come back. And to, con to the congregation, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen and amen. Amen.